Forced abortions, manipulating tenants, and human experimentation. Rewatching District 9 might make you question who the real monsters of the film are. After watching District 9 a few times, you may notice that the aliens have a variety of contrasting colors painted on their bodies. At the end of a Q&A session led by Adam Savage at a screening of the film, an audience member asked if there was any significance to the variation in color displayed on the aliens' bodies. Director Neil Blomkamp said that the variation does not imply a difference in heritage or social standing within their alien society. Although the colors have no significance regarding the prawn's social organization, you may have noticed they sport the Pan-African colors of red, gold, and green. While Christopher Johnson has a green hue, his friend who is killed at the beginning of the film has a yellow hue, and other aliens throughout the film have red hues. Using these particular colors which appear in the flags of many African nations, could be a message promoting a more unified African identity to combat xenophobia and discrimination against refugees from various African countries. At the end of his Q&A with Savage, Blomkamp confirms that the villainous organization Multinational United, or MNU, stamps the aliens in District 9 with a serial number to identify them. In several scenes, Christopher can be seen with a white property of MNU stamp on his head with a number next to it. This serial number creates a visual parallel between MNU's treatment of the aliens, chattel slavery in the United States, and the Jewish people imprisoned at Auschwitz during the Holocaust. It is clear MNU isn't just using serial numbers to identify the aliens living in District 9, but that the organization views the aliens as property rather than refugees living in a settlement. The aliens are regarded as something less than human. The stamp on their heads emphasizes this attitude, as does the derogatory slur prawn. Used by Johannesburg residents to refer to the aliens, the links to Nazi Germany's treatment of Jewish residents are also echoed later in the film. When Vickers tells Christopher he shouldn't go to District 10. You don't want to go to the tents, they're not better. They, they're smaller than the shacks, actually more like a concentration camp. One of the first truly disturbing scenes in District 9 which highlights the social commentary in the film depicts Vickers conducting what he calls an abortion of gestating alien offspring. Vickers even provides commentary for the film crew while the shack burns, saying, You hear that? You hear that? That's a popping sound that you're hearing. It's almost like a popcorn. Uh, what the egg does is it, 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 it pops up. Shortly after the nursery shack is burned, we learn killing alien children is illegal. But apparently, performing prawn abortions is simply an MNU policy that Vickers embraces. As pointed out in an analysis by The Artifice, Although Vickers follows direct protocol, he fails to recognize that he's exterminating a species. Vickers displays no remorse towards his actions, suggesting that he's adapted to the government's policies. This disturbing scene draws a correlation between the film and historical instances of forced sterilization as a means of population control for people of color in South Africa both during and after apartheid. Sadly, real-world South Africa and the South Africa depicted in District 9 are not unique in this shockingly inhumane behavior. Forced sterilization and eugenics programs have also been practiced in the U.S. on BIPOC populations as recently as the 20th century. Vickers employs manipulative methods to extract signatures from the aliens that are being evicted from District 9. MNU determined that they must inform the aliens of their eviction 24 hours before they are moved and they must sign paperwork acknowledging they were informed of their relocation to District 10. Vickers tricks one alien into signing by claiming that they will receive a can of cat food, a delicacy in District 9, in exchange for their signature. He also uses a discovery of illegal weapons in their residence, which marks them as gang members and criminals, to speed up the eviction process. When Christopher says he won't sign the paperwork because the eviction is illegal, Vickers threatens to take away his son, CJ. He uses the excuse that the garbage around the shack makes the residence unsuitable for CJ to live in, and that he is legally obligated to take CJ to social services. You said you want to stay. Your boy is coming down with me to child services. He's going to spend the rest of his life in a one-by-one-meter box. In District 9, the foster care system has been weaponized against the impoverished aliens. This mirrors similar events that transpired in the United States such as the separation of many native children from their family homes by the government and religious organizations. In District 9, Johannesburg residents regard the aliens as violent criminals and aimless scavengers. According to Human Rights Watch, undocumented individuals living in South Africa in 2008 suffered from similarly xenophobic violence, poverty, crime, and unemployment. 
Alive in Joburg, Blomkamp's 2005 mockumentary shorts that inspired District 9 features interviews taken from real Johannesburg residents speaking about immigrants. These interviews highlight the poor attitudes about refugees and migrants in South Africa. In a press release, Blomkamp said, in essence, there is no difference except that in my film we have a group of intergalactic aliens as opposed to illegal aliens. After Vickers gets infected with an alien fluid that begins transforming him, he begins to adopt the same criminal behaviors he holds against aliens in District 9. Not because he is becoming a prawn, but because he has become ostracized and impoverished overnight. He engages in violence to escape the MNU medical facility and steals clothing, a cell phone, and food after escaping because he has no other choice. The aliens aren't mindless drones, as the interviewees in the mockumentary suggest. They are refugees who lost their social structure and are imprisoned in a camp that controls their ability to live and perpetuates their poverty. These are issues real-life refugees must contend with while living in refugee encampments every day. So we have to come there and say, listen, this is our land. Uh, please, will you, will you go? Vickers' statement at the beginning of District 9 sounds strikingly similar to what the U.S. government told the indigenous population of North America when President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act, inciting a massive forced relocation of native people from their ancestral homes. The forced relocation of District 9 also has ties to South African history. According to the South African History Archive in 1966, District 6 was deemed a whites-only district by the 1950 Group Areas Act. Starting in 1968, 60,000 residents of District 6 were forced to relocate because they were black or biracial. Their homes were demolished and a new whites-only district was built in their place. In his Q&A with Adam Savage, Blomkamp spoke about how the neighborhood where he filmed District 9 was undergoing a forced relocation of residents to government-subsized housing while the movie was being filmed. The area is called Shiawello, and Blomkamp said the neighborhood was severely impoverished. In fact, the shacks depicted in the film were once the actual homes of Shiawello residents before their relocation. Although District 9 has been lauded for its anti-racism stance, it has also been criticized for the depiction of the Nigerian residents of District 9 who earn a living off the aliens, leaving critics and academics divided. The Mail and Guardian points out that, although the film succeeded in eventually making the audience sympathize with the aliens, the Nigerian characters in the film were depicted as being entirely reprehensible. You don't want to play with these boys. They'll cut you in four pieces with you push you on each side of... Okay, that's, that's a boss there. Okay, no problem. In the Adam Savage Q&A, Blomkamp acknowledged he was almost banned from Nigeria because of the controversy surrounding the negative depiction of Nigerians in the film. The prawns and Nigerians act as fictional stand-ins for real-world refugees and migrants who came to South Africa for a better life, only to meet resentment by indigenous and European South Africans. In her academic paper, Ashton Kirsten argues the director uses these stereotypes to uncover misguided nationalism and change our assumptions about immigrants. Of course, these negative attitudes about immigrants are not unique to South Africa. We need only look to the US to see a long history of anti-immigrant sentiment that has caused incredible harm to countless individuals and cultures. Unlike many going native stories, District 9 isn't about a man who discovers the beauty in another culture and embraces it like Jake Sully in Avatar, or Lieutenant Dunbar in Dancers with Wolves. Instead, Vickers is forced to see the humanity in an alien species only after transforming into a prawn himself. The utter disgust Vickers displayed when he sees his injured arm as transformed into a prawn arm reveals his racism toward the aliens. Vickers denies his transformation telling CJ they are nothing alike when the tiny alien compares their matching arms. Eventually, Vigas' transformation is too complete for him to continue denying it, and he finally sees humanity in Christopher and his son CJ. After this realization, Vigas treats the aliens with compassion, rather than being driven solely by self-interest. In his academic paper, Laszlo Sabo writes, in District 9, body horror becomes a medium for dehumanization that further stresses the inhumanity of the colonizers. Vickers' transformation into an alien forces him to confront the inherent racism of his culture and the self-loathing he feels as he transforms as a poignant depiction of internalized racism. When Vickers becomes a science experiment at the MNU Medical Laboratory, he is forced to fire alien weapons and even kill an unwitting prawn in a particularly upsetting chain of events. After MNU's tests are run, Vickers is faced with a choice, submit to the agency by having his organs fatally harvested for medical research 
or use his newfound alien strength to escape. During their raid to retrieve the rocket fuel responsible for Vickers' transformation, Christopher sees the experiments being carried out on his people at the MNU Medical Laboratory. His horror is made clear by his dejected stance as he hangs his head and stares at the corpses of aliens with the intense firefight between Vickers and MNU soldiers raging in the background. This history of experimenting on prisoners is broad. The Nazis experimented on Jewish prisoners during the Holocaust, and during World War II, the Japanese experimented on Chinese prisoners in Unit 731. This history of unethical experimentation also exists in South Africa. According to PBS, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uncovered details of the chemical and biological warfare programs run by South Africa's apartheid-era government, which specifically targeted the non-white population. Discover Magazine also exposed a long history of unethical experiments on oppressed populations in the US, from the Tuskegee Syphilis Study and the CIA's MKUltra studies, to a dermatologist's use of prisoners as test subjects in the mid-1950s. Discussing his thoughts on District 9, producer Peter Jackson told Entertainment Weekly, It's an utterly original film. In an industry that's looking to make movies out of every obscure TV show or sequels or video games, you look at District 9 and it's unlike anything you've ever seen before. While this statement is 100% true and District 9 is undeniably inventive, it is also a love letter to sci-fi, the genre Blomkamp grew up obsessing over. As Empire acknowledged in their District 9 review, the film is a treasure trove of references to sci-fi classics like Alien Nation, The Fly, and Robocop. For example, the suit Vickers wears to battle the MNU soldiers in the film's final confrontation is a not-so-subtle homage to the mech suits in Robocop. The director essentially confirmed this in an interview with First Showing, saying that Robocop was one movie that strongly influenced him as a filmmaker. Blomkamp told Time how the combination of his youth steeped in South Africa's turbulent history and his love of sci-fi came together and inspired him to create a sci-fi set in South Africa. The result was a truly unique film that celebrates an unabashed love of a genre while serving up satirical social commentary. At the very end of District 9, we see mockumentary footage of Vickers showing the camera crew a picture of his wife and telling them she is an angel. It's my special angel. She, she even looks like an angel with a halo. While the scene acts as a sweet sentiment showcasing Vickers' devotion to his wife, this line might also be a subtle reference to the Halo film project that fell apart before Blomkamp made District 9. Although Blomkamp's Halo movie never materialized, a TV adaptation premiered in March 2022 on Paramount+. Plus. In an interview with First Showing, Blomkamp spoke about how it was only after his live-action adaptation of the Halo video game fell apart that Peter Jackson suggested he develop a feature inspired by his short film Alive in Joburg. That twist of fate allowed Blomkamp to pioneer his own sci-fi franchise. As reported by Sci-Fi Wire, the director has teased the possibility of a sequel periodically since District 9 hit theaters, even telling an audience at San Diego Comic-Con, it's a very personal film and it's a universe and a place that I find incredibly creative. I'd love to go back to that universe." Blomkamp continues to say he is developing a District 9 sequel. In 2021, he even hinted to IGN the sequel would more directly address concepts related to American history.